you know, do your actions align with your words? And that's something that I realized that for years and years and years, I broke promises to myself on a daily basis. I would say all the same shit that everybody else would say. You know, on Monday morning, right? This is a Monday. We'd wake up foggy from Sunday with all these bullshit commitments that we were going to make. I'm not going to drink this week. You know, I'm going to stop gambling. I'm not going to gamble until Saturday. You know, like all these things that we tell ourselves, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the gym three days this week. You know, all these things that by Wednesday are a distant, distant memory. And I just got tired of breaking that commitment that I would make to myself every Monday or that, the, you know, the, 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 the pep talk I would have myself. And I just, this, like your life changes um, exponentially when you start to take personal responsibility. <laughs> You're listening to the Building Med Podcast. My name is Dennis Meralda. I'm here with my younger brother, Anthony. What's up, Anthony? How you doing? I changed it up a little bit to start. I'm trying to get that sweet spot of uh, figuring out the best way to, to go live with the podcast. So I changed it up a little bit today. What do you think? That's good. Well, I wish that you would put on the camera me so oh, yeah, you could see right. me. Oh, yeah. That's I need to do that. I that's know you like to job. see yourself, but I'm also here. Rather there than you just, are. Hey. I'm also a pretty face. You're pr- prettier. If not face. prettier, yeah. you uh, you look like a slob right now. I would go well. I, <laughs> Dude. I don't think I look like. I think this is a look. Yeah, it's like a winter look. All right, you know, I got the hat on. Winter rustic look. Yeah. All right, so look, before we get to winter look, let's. I wanted to talk about ball for a little bit. Okay. Just as before we bring our. I guests know what on. you're gonna say. Do you? I do. I know exactly. What do you what think I'm gonna say, say right now? I'm gonna talk about acorn squash. I, it was. I was gonna get there. I was gonna start <laughs> just by it's. I my favorite season is fall. Is it? I, I do. I love the fall. I love when it's a little bit chilly in the morning. I love the change of the leaves. I love, you know, that whole thing. It's like it's so sensitive. Up yeah, it really is. Like this. Yeah. And it, I like going, getting a cup of coffee, watching football, even like going to, you know, Pop Warner football games. I remember growing up, like watching you play football. It was like such a cool thing mm-hmm. on like a Saturday morning, a cup of coffee, go watch a game. I mean, it would quickly turn into beer ever right like oh right yeah that but, coffee yeah that so, transition was uh <laughs> yeah and and i also just the you know it's a little bit chillier just the whole fall season i like and i the reason i brought it up this morning was actually i got a pumpkin flavored coffee oh and i wanted to know your thoughts around the, the whole pumpkin thing before we like really coffee get, or just pumpkin pu- the pumpkin life in general it's like it, 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 it like takes over the world starting in september yeah. and it goes for a long time and i don't do like a whole bunch of sweet stuff but i just it's and it's not there's no cream or anything in the coffee just black coffee but pumpkin flavor but it's still that and it was nice pumpkin-y. I, I think every once in a while is like a treat it's good but when you do it every single time yeah. i disagree with that i so the window is from like i think it's like probably mid-september you can get away with it till thanksgiving and then after thanksgiving i don't think you could really do much more pumpkin after that then it's like more cinnamon or yeah, maybe Cinnamony. like cinnamon, cin- <laughs> right? Candy cane flavored. Uh. And another fun fact is I started um, into a candle lifestyle too. I, I got a candle at the grocery store and I started lighting a, the, like a pumpkin flavored candle. So pumpkin flavored too. Yeah, hm. I, don't I don't even know. I feel like I need to like punch you in the stomach right now or something. <laughs> right. This you is do, making me probably do. <laughs> well, I, listen, it's about being authentic, and and then the the other thing was about the like different layers of, or different kinds of squashes. Squash. Um, squash the only squash I. that I had ever heard of was butternut squash, and you were talking about acorn squash. That's correct. And um, I'm going to use it as the first question as we bring in our guest. <laughs> His name is Brian Panuzzo. He helps career focused men get the body they want, reignite their relationship and marriage while making more money at work he's also the host of the success lift podcast welcome to building men nice to see you my man thanks for being here brian i can't believe i'm talking to two other guys from jersey right Right. now this can't be you guys you guys can't be from jersey can you (laughs) right so you're 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 out on the left coast right now so let's before we get into the acorn squash thing, because I don't want to, I don't want to drop that that squash. Don't gloss over that. Don't. I don't want to gloss <laughs> over it. So you, you are, um, you're a Jersey guy. You grew up, you grew up in in the area. So tell us about that. What, like, where'd you grow up, and how'd you make the transition over? All right. First of all, Anthony, you're looking very Venice uh, uh, right now. Is what I would like to say. That's like you got your 62 degree 
cool morning Venice look going yes, on with the it. flannel. I love that. And that's one way to say it rather than what? looking like a fucking dirtbag or whatever you said. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. When the I temperature drops it. below 63 out here. People have a real problem. Yeah. You see a lot of hoodies. You see a lot of North Faces. Uh, you get into the 50s and the parkas come out. So um, so you're ready. You're ready to jump on a plane, buddy. Come All on right. out whenever you want. Absolutely. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about Halloween, a lot of thoughts about candles, but we can save that uh, for <laughs> a few minutes from now. Uh, I appreciate both of you having me on. Yeah. This would be a, a, a really fun conversation. If listening to your intro uh, is is any indication, I think we're going to have, have a blast. Yes. Uh, yeah. I am from New Jersey. My name is Brian Panuzzo. Uh, I grew up in Bergen County. Uh, Cresco, New Jersey is the last town that I lived in. I grew up in a town called Bergenfield. Both are five miles uh, outside of, you know, um, uptown Manhattan, I grew up 10 miles from, from Midtown. So, you know, right next to the George Washington bridge, uh, very much an alpha male, tough guy, Jersey guy, uh, spent 20 years on wall street. I was a basketball player. I played uh, pretty competitive basketball for my high school and college, uh, years. And then a little bit afterwards and, uh, ultimately transitioned to a a uh, long Wall Street career that lasted 20 years that ended uh, a couple of years ago. And I can go a million different directions uh, from here. Yeah. Uh, I'm married with two kids, uh, have gone through a ton of, uh, you know, issues and transformations myself, uh, none of which are unique, all of which most men go through. Uh, and that's kind of what I help a lot of people do right now. So I'm happy to take this conversation yeah. anywhere you want to go, including Halloween candy candles or helping men we will we'll hit every single one of those topics well i need to just say have you ever heard of acorn squash i have i'm a health coach right. damn it i mean you know this real food that, stuff and i've it, even listened to you bud like i listened to you with your diet and and eating you know uh one ingredient foods and, yeah. and it doesn't have a heartbeat i mean come on man you got to know about this stuff damn, all right, right. so i made you. anthony a bet we were gonna just randomly talk to 40 different people um, and I said less than half would have heard of acorn squash. And I said people are gonna know what it because I was eating acorn. I had I had a nice ribeye steak. I had some acorn squash. And he was like, "What the fuck is acorn squash? <laughs> like, what? What even? Nobody knows what that is." I was like, "Every." Ow. And just because his son, who's 16 years old, didn't know what it was, all of a sudden everybody and their mother has no idea what acorn squash is. And I'm like, I think I, a more interesting question would be, could you pick out the difference between a butter and an acorn? I, I would fail. I mean, it's only two, so it's a 50-50 shot, but I would most likely fail that. It would be a guess. But yes, I have heard the term acorn squash. They're actually really different, the the, the look of them. Well, I, a butternut squash looks like a gigantic cock. I mean, pretty much like it. it like I mean, that's that's, it, that'd be the biggest one. I've, ever, but like it has that kind of fat, like, it, like a it's got a ball shape and then a at gigantic the bottom and then it comes to a, I hate these descriptions of a fucking, <laughs> now I can't eat acorn squash for the next two months. So, so Right. So, how, how many other squash are there? You said there. I, besides I, I didn't. I see. I should have looked this up because I knew you were going to fucking yeah. bring it up today, and I didn't do my research on. It. I know there's more. I feel like there's plenty more because I was looking up like the in seat, like the seasonal foods for the fall, and I try and eat within like the seasons. And I know that the squashes and stuff come out, um, but I don't know. But all I know is that so a uh, acorn squash looks like a softball. It's about okay. the size of a softball, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And it has different colors. It's like a greenish, like yellow or like orangey on the outside. So I, w I would like to invite you to my um, to my house next week. But the, the day before I drive you to the airport, I'll I'll make the meat and you bring the, the squash. Bring the squash. Right. Yeah, we'll do a little taste of the squash. Guy. squash. We'll do it virtually too, Brian. We'll, we'll see if we can we'll get you. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Bring your and own then squash. next time you're back here in Jersey, we gotta, you know, we gotta do a taste squash on that too. And candles, squash, date. squash so, and candles. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the, um, <laughs> to your growing up in Bergen County. So, um, you know, being Jersey guys, and th definitely there's a difference between North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey. So yeah. we grew up. I grew up on um, Central Jersey, closer to Rutgers, uh, okay. Jersey Shore kind of area. So, and then I went to school to college in South Jersey at Rowan. It was a different state. You know, it was. It seemed like it was mm. below the Mason Dixon line. It just seemed like very, very <laughs> different. And so, growing up from North Jersey, did you notice that? Did you notice that there was kind of like a different culture in different parts of the state? You know, no. I think would be the the short answer because you know my my South Jersey experience was going to DJs and Belmar and Point Pleasant and and you know doing summers and playing summer league basketball. You know, down there. And that was a bunch of guidos, which was basically what I knew of, yeah. you know, 
of, of North Jersey as well. And so, um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily my upbringing. You know, I went to an all boys Catholic high school. Like we weren't walking around with like, you know, huge gold chains and our, and our, you know, shirt buttons down. Uh, but that was certainly, a uh, you know, someone, someone that I, that we all admired from afar and, uh, definitely partook in a lot of those types of activities. So I didn't really notice a difference between, you know, North and South personally. And it's funny, like when you say Belmar, that's, that was kind of central Jersey. And I would consider And so that. like, if you're from and Bergen then, County, that's South Jersey. Because that's that's, 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 that's funny yeah. to me. Cause I look at that yeah, and yeah. Like, the more South you go. And that's when it starts yeah, to get It's like, like a guy, it's like someone from the city saying they went to like Woodbury commons and they went upstate. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, so George Washington Bridge, you said you were right in the, you know, in the shadow of the bridge. Or were you an upper or lower level guy for the bridge? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, years and years and years lower. Yeah, Always me too. Lower. Always me lower. Too. Yeah. Why is Until, that? I, you know, you, we took like, uh, were you an Eastern Spur? Or, well, well, you probably didn't really do, do this as much. But up by me, the turnpike splits Eastern and Western Spur uh, north of like the Meadowlands. Yeah. And then like, you know, just just south down to like the, the I guess, the parkway exit, I guess. Um, and I was always a Western spur guy. So I, you tell you like, you tell yourself this story that it's a better way. You know, I had a, I had a sneaky way up the upper West side from midtown that I, that I was for certain was way faster than sitting on the West side highway. And then when ways comes about, you know, comes into, uh, uh, existence, like it tells me to go to the West side highway every single time, you know? So like <laughs> we tell ourselves a story that like, it's a better way and, and we convince ourselves. So I was a lower level guy for sure. I was a lower level guy too. And we would go to games at Yankee stadium. We actually had, um, season tickets at Yankee stadium, um, in the bleacher section 39, which was, that was just a scene going there. And what I would no. do is I would typically, whatever it said, like if it said to take the upper lo- level, I would go lower. Just because mm-hmm. everybody would see that, and those people would would do what I they like were saying, it. and I yeah. went the opposite way. But typically, <laughs> I was going lower level. It's a talk about telling yourself a story. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it was like a whole I'll psychology the behind yeah. that. Um, I I struggled with when I was when I when I moved uh, from Edgewater. I lived in Edgewater for seven years, right on the river, and I moved up to the burbs to Cresskill, where I was was very convenient off of the Palisades Parkway, and the the easiest way to get to the to Palisades off of the GW bridge is, uh, is the upper level because there's a separate uh, on-ramp right onto the Palisades. If you go lower level, you got to go back streets in Fort Lee a little bit. And I got to, I got to be honest, I had a real problem. I had a real problem, like, you know, taking the upper level every day, like, yeah. you know, without like, I'm like, I got to consider at least going to lower every once in a while now. But, so growing up in your high school, you mentioned you played um, played basketball. Talk to us a little bit about that experience. You know, you mentioned you were, you know, North Jersey guy, that kind of like alpha male, tough guy kind of thing. What was your high school basketball experience like growing up in North Jersey? It was awesome. You know, we were, I went to Bergen Catholic. So all boys Catholic high school, very sports centric. You know, they're, they're, you know, even now they're, they're amazing in, yep. in football, basketball, a ton, ton of different sports. Um, I loved it. Quite frankly, I was a little nervous going into, Going into high school, going to a school without girls, you know, I, I only went for the athletics. Bergen Catholic had an amazing athletic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, academic education and experience. But, you know, I only went because of sports. And uh, I thought I was going to be, it was going to be super weird and being a, the, um, the most amazing experience of my life. Uh, I would say, you know, of my top 15 to 20 friends, you know, 10 are still high school guys. Wow. And so my wife, you know, oftentimes kind of makes fun of us. She wonders if you know she's like I, I don't get it every time you guys hang out with each other it's like the first time you've ever experienced alcohol like what what happens to you <laughs> when you get together with these guys um and so you know the bonds that that we created were were pretty pretty incredible and uh yeah i don't know i don't know if it was a unique you know class that i had i don't know if it was the fact that it was all boys and we got to be our truly ourselves and didn't have to worry about impressing anybody we could look like to a certain extent anthony and show up to school every day you know um, we didn't, we weren't allowed to wear, wear the winter hat, but you know, your hair could be messed up. You didn't have to press anybody. I got a, I got a big red dot on my nose right now. No yeah. big deal going to Bergen Catholic, right? You don't have to worry about these things. So it relieved some pressure, relieved a lot of pressure. And then, um, you know, from an athletic experience, it was amazing because we were good. We were really good and we played great competition. Um, and I got exposure to, a, you know, a lot of places, people and, and, uh, and experiences that I, I probably would not have if I went to Bergenfield high school, to be honest. I'm really happy you brought up the pimple on your nose. <laughs> I, 
you, you posted about it on Instagram, and I was like, I, I was like, that would be pretty funny if I just like mentioned it nonchalantly during the course of the interview. But I love that you <laughs> you called it out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, when when it's this big, it, it, when it's this big, you got to say something about it because every, everyone's noticing it. So I got to tell you, I have a blackout on my nose. It's been there for I feel like three years. It's when I see a close. You need up a picture team myself. of scientists oh to try and figure out what the I feel fuck's like it going goes on through there. to my spine. Like yeah. I feel like if you were to really get it out, but every time I try to pop it like you squeeze a blackhead i get like a like a welt on my nose like it looks like yeah. i got punched square in the face so now i'm just like it's just gonna, i'm just gonna have a black nose pretty soon well, it's just, just gonna totally take over my whole it. face yeah just no, no, you, let it be tell you to stop I, like don't touch whatever you're, you're like you start thinking about it and no, you need I to agree. touch it i know uh, but um, it, i always i'm gonna ask you to about... stop touching your penis during this episode because i see you doing it right now you haven't i do that on... right now either <laughs> No, truth Brian be told, you blood. haven't been. I do it on every episode, first of all, so how dare you? <laughs> you don't get that much credit, Brian. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, I always wondered, speaking of touching yourself, I was thinking, like, because in high school, I always wondered people go to all-boys schools. Like, oh. for me, like, 90% of school was trying to look a certain way in front of girls, trying to act a certain way, dress a certain way, hiding unintentional boners all day long. Mm. Like, I, it was literally, like, that's where my focus went in classroom. God forbid, if any girl was wearing like a low cut shirt, my mission was to look at her the whole entire class. I didn't pay attention to shit ever. It mm. was literally like to the point of, I don't need, I don't think I learned anything right. in high school at all. So I, I feel like that's probably was a benefit for you in the sense of like, you're just hanging out with guys all the time and just like can actually probably get more done or maybe the other way around. I don't know if you would end up like bullshitting a lot and like fucking around more. There was a great balance of both. You know, we, we were we were certainly a, a tremendous uh, group of idiots, you know, for, for periods of time. Um, you know, certainly missed being able to look down a low cut shirt as well. Uh, but, you know, also the benefit was that we could not worry about anything. We could not worry about, you know, having to impress anyone. Uh, you could rip one and not have to worry about right, yeah. <laughs> sitting next to a good looking yeah. girl next to you, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, again, like you really, you, you, you honestly could show up. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of hair and I didn't have a whole lot of hair in high school, although I did try to grow it out a little bit and then part it down the middle. It's another story, we, I did the same uh, thing. but, but, uh, but, but you didn't have to worry about really what you look like and it, it freed you up, you know, it gave yeah. you some freedom to be yourself, to focus on, you know, things that were important to you, whether it be academics, whether it be athletics or whether it be building the relationships that, you know, we did. So. I wrote down a tremendous group of idiots and quote unquote. I think that's a really cool. I, I love that. It yeah. might be part of the title of this episode. It's, you know, it's sometimes the funniest comments are the truest ones. And, you know, my friends would love, love, love you and love me. For, yeah. For that, for, uh, for that, that comment. So yes. take us to, as you're playing basketball, as you know, I played basketball and baseball in high school. Anthony played football and baseball in high school. And you have certain coaches that, can inspire you in, in specific ways or help you become better than you are. And you also have coaches. I had a specific coach who took every opportunity to cut me down. And I, there was a lot of shame that I felt or, um, you know, there was like that, <clears throat> that emotion of shame whenever I was playing basketball. So do you remember a lesson from a coach or, you know, the way you, you showed up for a coach that really helped you as you were making like your, you know, life moves, especially that big life move that you made. And we'll talk about it a little bit from, from East coast to West coast. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, bo both my high school coaches, I, I were extremely different and, um, uh, and I'm thinking about it, you know, taught very different lessons. My, my JV coach, uh, was a, was a, a brother, brother Thomas Jensen and brother Jensen was, um, the hardest, um, who, let me see the best way to describe brother Jay. He, he, he was the most committed, hardest working, um, most stern, most disciplined person I had, and any of us had ever met. He, uh, suffered from kidney failure. He went for dialysis twice a day for hours. Uh, we never knew that he, you know, that he was doing this. Uh, he lived this way for a really, really long time. He coached, actually coached Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at Power Memorial in the Bronx. Wow. And this was his, la his last job was at Bergen. So he's an older guy. And uh, back when Kareem was Lou Alcindor. And so he had this way of speaking to you. You know, there was no, there's not that, many not that many people watching a JV game. So his voice would just pierce the entire gym. And so when he, um, when, when you weren't doing something that was up to his standard, which was a very high standard, um, he let you know about it. And the entire gym knew about it, not because he was, 
you know, yelling at you just because his, he had one of those voices that just projected uh, and just pierced the entire gym. And so there were several occasions where I remember being in timeouts where Brother Jensen would choose to speak to the other four guys in the game uh, and, and effectively ignore me for that 30 or 60 seconds and then tell everyone why he was only speaking to them at the end because I wasn't upholding my end of the, holding up my end of the bargain as a teammate. Um, and you better believe like when you got back out onto the court the next time, like you, you know, your effort improved. My varsity coach was very different. He was not, um, a disciplinarian. You know, we sort of walked all over him. Uh, honestly, uh, he wasn't really even a great X's and O's guy. Uh, but what he was, was he was a father figure to all of us. And most of us had great fathers in our lives, but you know, he, ins he instilled this sense of camaraderie in the program that, that I've never seen in another program to this day in, 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 you know, 25, you know, plus years living beyond, you know, that time. And we're, we were truly a family, uh, guys from decades would come back, you know, decades, like the guys in the eight, I graduated in 1995 guys in the, in the mid eighties, late eighties, early nineties, all every, all these groups would come back. They would play open gym with us in the summer. Uh, they would play, uh, during the, we had a big a Christmas time game ritual, um, Christmas Eve, they would have a, they would have a light practice, and then alum, alumni would come back for an alumni game. There was a sense of camaraderie and family amongst the program that he fostered uh, that would not have been there without him. So, you know, really understanding that teams become this sense of family for you, a locker room. Burton Catholic was a massive locker room, you know, and I ultimately transitioned to another locker room, which was working on a Wall Street trading desk for twenty years. And honestly, that, that's one thing, you know, not having competitive competitive athletics anymore and not working in that environment anymore. I miss the most. I miss that the most. I miss the locker room. I miss being able to challenge somebody. I miss being able to get an instant feedback, you know, on a, on a trading desk or in the locker room, you get instant feedback. If you're doing something that's not up to the standard of the, of the team, the code of the team, um, I miss the ball busting, yeah. you know, all the things that come with that. And so those are the, you know, those are the two kind of, uh, you know, experiences that I sort of take away from, from both of the coaches that I had in high school. And I think it's that sweet spot being able to, hold your team accountable and be that, you know, X's and O's disciplinarian guy who, you know, when you speak, everybody, there's a little bit of healthy fear along with it. Um, but then also building community and being supportive. And I, being able to have back to back years, those two men was probably paramount and just you developing your own sense of what masculinity meant to you, um, from an outsider. For sure. Yeah, totally agree. So before we get into that whole, you know, career switch, um, Scented pumpkin candles, yes or no? I mean, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. It's a hard no. <laughs> it's a hard no. The only, yeah, the only thing pumpkin, uh, listen, you're, you, you walk into a little bit of a hornet's nest here, so I'm going to just... I'm uh, ready uh, for uh, it. Bring I'll, it on. I'll, yeah. I'll give you a little bit of a pass. <laughs> no, uh, this I'm, is what I, I am. I am, if there is a Halloween Scrooge, I, I am him. Okay. I am it. All right? Um, I have two young kids. I have a 12 and a 7-year-old. We call it booing out here. It was called ghosting in New Jersey. So what happens is on like the last week of September, starting in the last week of September, your doorbell around 845, just when the kids are just about ready to fall asleep, right? The dog is in one of their beds. She's relaxed. She's passed out. Someone rings your doorbell, right? And then runs away and leaves a bag of candy. So your two kids wake up, the dog goes bananas, right? And then you spend the next half hour negotiating with your four, five, six, seven-year-old how many Skittles she can have at 9 p.m. on a Tuesday night, okay? And that doesn't happen on Halloween Eve. That happens on September 30th. And it goes on, off and on, for the next 31-plus days, right? So I got a problem with Halloween. It's a one-day holiday. I'll give, like, the maybe the week leading up, maybe a couple of days afterwards to eat your candy. But then we got to get it the hell out of here, and we got to move on. It does not need to start the first week of October. I live in an, an amazing community called Palos Verdes, California. It's an unbelievable community on the, on the southern section of LA. They do Halloween like like off the charts here, like decorations off the charts, like Christmas decorations in yeah. Jersey. Think that, okay? Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 on steroids out here. So it's like a real test of my, of, uh, you know, uh, the universe really is testing me because it knew already that I didn't really love Halloween, and so. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a Scrooge when it comes to it. The only thing I would say that's great about Halloween, you know, as, as it pertains to pumpkins, I'm a huge fan of like, give me some like banana, pumpkin, chocolate chip bread, like that I, that I can go with. That See, I can go with. 
So the booing and ghosting thing, it, that started out in the, in the last couple of years. Like, it wasn't something that we grew up yeah. with. That wasn't. Yes. Yeah, I, was so never, I, grew, I never grew up with that. I agree with I think whoever did that, uh, they need to be arrested. It's a bad it's, person. Uh, yeah. It's... I, it's like you, the idea around community, but you need to really fully think that through. It's that's a shit show. Yeah, it really I, is. At least do it during the day. You know, I mean, I, just get a little, get a little bit better. At, you know, a little, little like ring the door, ring the doorbell, get out of there, or just or just hand it to him. Yeah, you know, nice just get door. what do you, what is this person hiding? From? And then everybody starts posting about it on on social media. Oh, my ghost was so generous; they gave me this, that, and I don't know. I'd say we boycott it. I, and have I've you had this happen to your family? Yeah, but well, in, when we were in Union Street in Bordentown, there was that, like, there was some candy stuff. And then there was also, like, an adult version where it was adult <laughs> beverages. I don't remember what time of year it happened. If it was around Halloween, where it was like, you know, so if you're going to knock on my doorbell and you leave me a six pack of something, oh, let's go. Like, I, like, so I, 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 would, I would say that would, might change my opinion about it. Right. And if people start doing that, then we'll see what happens. But so, right now, I'm not. Yeah, just getting Skittles for the kids. So if you're out in Brian's community, let's start that right now. We'll, and, and he will absolutely <laughs> pay it forward yeah. to so many people in the future so that yeah. i did walk into a hornet's nest not realizing um did you did you know that he was an anti no not at all i no. listen I, it you was just a went in i went that's in full insane. force forward i and i'm so happy i didn't even I know that he was into like pumpkin scented candles the and spice pumpkin can is the pie the, sp the pumpkin spice candle is a very vulnerable thing for you to lead with so that i appreciate yeah, I appreciate yeah it was that, and but, again i told yeah. you there's no script it was i was sitting here with a and i'm like let me start so that's there. what that is that's a pumpkin coffee <laughs> it's black though it's like unfucking no you can't make up for it being no it's just like i don't want it <laughs> you fucking out of your mind so is it is it just the pumpkin candles or so let me throw out another question though is it or candles just candles yes i love no? candles so like what's your just a, like would you ever sit there and do like a meditation and light a candle and just like all right let me get in the mood here like take i have a i have a strong opposition to pumpkin candles i, I have an opposition to candles in general in general okay it's um, just not as strong it's not it's not as strong it's not as strong yeah. Okay. So part of what you do is you help men reignite their marriage. Like, where do <laughs> candles play into that whole game, there, Brian? Like, how do you? What Listen, do you if your wife is into candles, then you're supposed to be lighting candles. Read the damn room, but <laughs> it's not a prerequisite to reigniting your marriage. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. All right. See, I'm gonna. You know, we're gonna agree to disagree on the candle thing, and that's fine. I love that. So I respect okay. that. I respect that. Right. You're wrong, but I respect <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> so we need more of this healthy. Dis healthy. We uh, do. We absolutely do. Right. Right. Um, this is what our society is missing right it now. It absolutely is. People are too afraid to just come out with their true feelings yeah. about scented candles. And it's listen, I once I had the first one, I went out and I bought like seven more. I'm like I need seven to, more candles? Candles. Right. Not they're not all um pumpkin, but they're like okay. fall flavors. And listen, that's is, that was never my thing. It's just this is a recent development within the last month or so. Um I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna explore it a little bit deeper just to see is this a fad or is this it, have I just been ignoring this this side of myself for for, for many years? Um, so for those of you listening, you can't see Brian is putting his his like his hand in his forehead, saying like, yeah, and fuck? I'm not hiding my zit what either. The, what the fuck yeah. did I agree to? It's a complete shame. It's not out of hiding my zit. You're like, I grew up in the same fucking state as these guys. Yeah. I couldn't wait to talk to <laughs> right. some Jersey guys, and he's talking I'll about talk some hard ass candles, Jersey right? guys, and you start all of your fucking <laughs> scented candles and listen. All right, so now to get back to like all right, over the George Washington Bridge. Now you're working in New York. You're working in Manhattan, and you were working. Um, is it on Wall Street where you were working? No, I worked in Midtown my entire okay. career. So Wall Wall Street in quotes. Okay. I was a high yield bond trader. I uh, worked. I started at Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor in their training program. A couple years into that, moved uh, to UBS to work on a trading desk as an assistant, trading assistant to a business, uh, a fixed income uh, focused business. And I worked within our high yield department, think junk bonds, think riskier companies that may not pay you back. Ultimately, they pay you a higher interest rate uh, for that risk. Uh, but that was, you know, what I did. And I, and I pretty much stayed within, you know, I, I shifted slightly here and there uh, within different sort of niches within that. But, you know, until I left uh, that career two and a half years ago, that's the product that I traded. And that's the, uh, that's the, um, the profession that I had. Can you... Do you know what I'm going to say right now? Do, no. I All right. Know. So, did you know Glenn Gulia from uh, Wedding Wedding Singer? He was. Uh, did I know him personally? Did you, no. Was that was that I like? like Gullia, though. Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that that's like that was you? You were like Glenn Gulia. Gullia, Gullia. Yeah, yeah. You named yeah. him Julia Gulia. 
That's that's funny. Why is it funny? Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, so we love to talk to people that have they they feel like they're they're on this track in life and they're doing you know whatever they thought they were supposed to be doing and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. whether it's they have this moment of clarity or they have an epiphany or they what for whatever reason they have to shift their focus and they go in a totally different direction because there's so oh. many men out there especially that feel all right I've done this I just have to keep doing it and just put in the next <clears throat> ten years. And maybe I'm miserable, but at least I'll get this specific pension. So you had to shift, and you or you decided to shift and change. What was it that um, that was the the catalyst for you making that big life change and moving from doing what you're doing to what you're doing now? Yeah, it was a series of events. It started with uh, about seven years ago or so. Uh, a number of events happening, kind of in about a six month period. My my mother was diagnosed with ALS, which is a ultimately a fatal neurological disease. She passed away uh, eight months or so after uh, she was diagnosed. She she had very obvious symptoms a year or two for a year or two before that that were a bit ignored. Things like that. <clears throat> um, my son, who was now twelve, he was five at the time. He was very into Legos, uh, which I have a, a equally strong disdain for, as I do spiced pumpkin candles. Um, he would just hand, you know, as any kid does, he would hand you the Lego for, for forever and say, dad, put this together. And then finally around five, you know, they come back 16 times every 40 seconds and ask you if the 700 piece set is done yet. Right. You, you finally, after two days, finish that, you know, that, that piece. And then they break it in 14 seconds, you know, things like that. So, uh, he finally was starting to do some of the, the, uh, putting together on his own. But he would ask me for help, and one day he asked me for help, and I realized I couldn't get down on the ground and and play with him. My body wouldn't allow me to. My body was pretty broken down. I suffered from a lot of joint pain, knee pain. I couldn't physically be on the ground with him and connect with him at a level that I really wanted to. And for <clears throat> excuse me, years, I had told myself this story that I'm a big guy. I'm 6'6". Six, six. Uh, obviously, I played basketball. I had this commute in and out of the city every day, about an hour each way in the car. Then we sat on the desk. We didn't stand at all. We didn't move. We didn't exercise. My my <clears throat> mirror for success was looking across the desk and seeing this um, guy making a couple million dollars a year who was 50 pounds overweight, who limped for his first 10 or 15 steps, who was either divorced or near divorced you know, complaining about his body and how he felt, that was my image of success. And that's not an excuse. That's just what I, you know, that was how I was indoctrinated into sort of my corporate life. And so I sort of realized that I told myself these stories, you know, big guy, ex-basketball player, how many ex-athletes you see limping around. This was sort of my destiny. And finally, the one that really, the catalyst that really was, or the event that really was the catalyst for me was shortly after my mom passed away, uh, my wife, came to me with, an, with a, pretty much an ultimatum. You know, uh, We had two young kids. I had spent the eight months that my mom was, was sick the way I had spent the last 10 or 15 years of my life, um, you know, effectively ignoring really hard things or sedating them away. So I was re- really good at you know, drinking just enough for you to not know that I was drunk, uh, smoking just enough for you to not know I was high, taking whatever pills I could find. I often say I, I couldn't have a tough Tuesday at work without coming home and having two beers, a Percocet, you know, a gummy or whatever else I had, you know, whatever, I, but I was really good at, you know, keeping it in the lane, in, in like in, in the, in my lane and, and not, you know, ending up in a ditch, not losing too much money gambling that had my, I was like able to move money around bank accounts enough. You know, I was sort of a professional at all this stuff and she sort of knew what was going on, but you know, things really started to come to it, to a, to a head for me um, in the last month or two of my mom's life because I was physically present. That was one thing I'm, I'm, it's my, it's still my superpower to this day showing up. Like I'm, you're, you're not going to really show up more than I do. I, I show up every day and I, and I, and I work. Um, but mentally I was completely checked out. You know, I was sedated. Uh, I did whatever I had to do not to deal with the pain that I was dealing with. I did this when my mom died. I did this when my best friend died, uh, you know, five or six years prior to that. And she said, this is not what I signed up for. You know, we have two young kids. We have a six month old and a five year old. I'm going to hang around for a while, but this isn't exactly what I want. And so I just want to let you know that. And that was the beginning for me to realize that this life that I had created that on the surface looked to be perfect, right? I checked all the boxes. I had the big house. I didn't have, there was no, there was no picket fence, but, but proverbially we had the picket fence. I had two kids, a dog, the country club membership, 
couple of cars. We went on nice vacations. I was by no means like uber wealthy, but like I never, and I don't say this to sound like a douchebag. I didn't think about money. Like, cause I just went and made it, you know, we saved some, we spent a lot. I made it, we saved some, I spent a lot. And that was the pattern. That was the cycle that I was in for 15 years to that point. And I just found myself, you know, I go back, going back to college. I, I, I decided to be a, a business and economics major because the guys on my basketball team that were older were business and economics majors. I lived in New Jersey, right outside of New York City. Everyone went and got internships in the summer. So I got an internship. I made a decision about my life when I was 17 years old that I really didn't waver from <laughs> for another 23 years. You know, and and how many people really do that? You know, maybe they go into these little different, you know, niches of, of a particular industry, but how many people make a decision? about a major in college and then find themselves wake up in air quotes, right? At 40 years old in their mid thirties in their early mid forties, whatever, and go, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. And so the, the choice that I made when my wife uh, delivered this message to me was, well, shit, I gotta, I gotta make some changes because uh, I've paid a pretty massive cost and I never really considered it. And so, you know, my brain thinks a lot in economics and sports, you know, that's kind of what my two things I'm, I'm good at. And, you know, there's a concept in, in economics that there, there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? That was the first thing I was taught in economics 101 in college. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Right now, the three of us are taking time out of our day to talk to each other. We could be doing other things. There's the cost to this conversation. Now, the benefit is going to be, obviously, there's been amazing benefits, right? Just right. listening Already. to you guys, yeah. right? Yeah. But, and hopefully other people, when they listen, they'll be, receiving a benefit, but they'll also be paying a cost because they won't be able to do something else. And it's, I think it's that concept that we don't actually consider, especially as men, especially as career driven, you know, people building a family and uh, being husbands and fathers and things like that. And I sort of woke up to that again, in air quotes, I woke up to it. And what I mean by woke up, this, this was accumulating just like debt accumulates, just like our savings accumulates. Another powerful phenomenon for me is compound interest. This stuff accumulated. Like my mom got sick and died. I had no control over that. You know, that was a short period of time, but I wasn't able to, or not able to get down the ground with my son because something happened to me a week before. That was how I treated my body for 15 years after college. You know, my wife didn't decide one day that because of my behavior last weekend, she was going to deliver this message to me. She probably sat on that for five years, you know? And so uh, I started to make a lot of changes. I changed with my health. I lost some weight. I got into shape. Uh, I started to open up my mind to, you know, different things. Uh, a lot of people that I found from a fitness standpoint were also into this weird thing called personal development for a guy from Jersey, a Wall Street guy, an athlete from Jersey. Um, I started to take home. I swapped vices, you know? I, I drank a little less. I did a little less drugs. I gambled a little less. And I started to listen to nutrition podcasts. I read a personal development book. I listened to you know somebody else. And so I slowly but steadily started to make some changes. Nothing was completely wholesaled, you know, turned on a dime, 180. Uh, it was slow and steady behavior. And then I started to identify different things that ultimately ended up leading me to starting a side hustle, coaching people. Um, moving across the country. It was a little bit mutually exclusive from my career change. Uh, but yeah, a couple of years ago, decided to hang up the Wall Street hat and, uh, and, and do this, give this coaching thing a shot. So that was the last 20 years of my life in a, in, in a yeah. slight, not so brief nutshell, but uh, I'm happy to expand on any of it uh, that you want. Yeah. And one, I mean, I, I think that's tremendous going through that and having the courage. Think about how much courage it takes to, to so totally scary to make a change like up. that, especially when on paper you have everything together you know in everyone else's eyes your life is perfect <laughs> like, i'll tell you and i think one of the reasons sure. why you and i connected immediately was you know we have that in common yeah um and, uh, and you know there's there's so many um synonymous things that happen i mean it, mine was a little bit different um i was going through a divorce at that time you know and it was, you know, an erosion. When you think about there's things that happen that it's an event that it, it's an earthquake and it shatters the ground or there's something that happens slow over time. Um, and I think it was a little bit of both. But that being able to walk away from something, everyone told me I was crazy. You're going to leave a job making this amount of money, 
basically have to coast out for another 10 years and you'll have a full pension with, with benefits, just hold on. And for me, I was like, I can't hold on anymore, you know, and I, and what am I holding on to? Because I don't believe in the, the cliff that I'm holding on to. I would rather fall down, try to find the right spot to climb up and then go on that journey. So what you mentioned, there were a couple podcasts that you listened to nutrition podcasts. Were there, was there one or two pieces of advice that you heard um, from someone else or even that you read about that you can recall and say, you know what, this really, this statement, this book, this podcast made such a huge difference to help me have the courage to take that leap? You know, I, I, don't, I don't recall a particular statement. There were, you know, one podcast I found, uh, one guy I found was named Sean Stevenson. Um, he's the host of the Model Health Show. Oh, I was just going to say the uh, um, Eat Smarter. I was going to ask you if you read that book because I was Yeah, Eat the... Smarter and Sleep Smarter. Yeah. So he wrote two really good books. He wrote, he wrote um, uh, Anthony, wrote, he wrote just as good a one on sleep. That was his first book. Yeah. Um, and so both of those books are great. Just the way he approached uh, the approach to, you know, health and wellness, obviously as a basketball guy, I was into hip hop and like his movie references and his current event references were, were really, really powerful. Uh, so there was him. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years, so this is now three plus years ago. Uh, I, I, I had made some health transformations, right. I, I kind of fixed my body, but I was in a much better place. My marriage was saved, but not like where I really wanted it to be. Um, I found this guy named Jay Ferugia, who's also a New Jersey guy. Uh, he had moved out to to California. He had, he's since moved back to, he's moved to Florida recently, but um, I started to listen to his podcast. I went to high school with a guy named Joe DeFranco, who's a big uh, fitness guy and, and Joe and uh, Jay are friends. And so I, I heard of Jay through Joe and uh, it's just like, it, I just connected with him like online, how you sort of like you hear a podcast, you listen to somebody, you're like, I kind of like this guy, you know, he was into the giants and the Yankees and I'm not diehard of either, but you know, root for both and into hip hop. And he was starting this men's group or, or restarting this men's group, a, a mastermind for the year, a coaching group. So we would get together four times live. We would have weekly coaching calls. We would do these different things together. And I, I, fa I found myself called to it and I did what I do a lot of times. Um, not so much anymore, but what I really did, I kicked tires. I took my phone and I saw the post and I was like, that sounds like a great idea. And then I put it down and I forced myself in the moment to go grab my phone and like sign up for it, schedule a call. Cause I knew if I didn't, the same thing would happen. Uh, I would just move on to the next thing that, that looked interesting to me and getting in that group with like 12 or 15 guys, whatever it was, I was the unicorn. I was the only wall street guy. I was the only, I was one of very few there were very few non-fitness guys in there, <clears throat> but I realized like I had just as much in common with these guys as, you know, if not more than the guys that I work with every day. And I realized that all of these guys were having similar problems. You know, all of them felt, you know, unworthy. All of them felt like imposters in a lot of ways. All of them struggled with a lot of things, you know, at home when they were successful at work, they struggled at home. And I just started to realize like, guys have all the same problems. We just convince ourselves that we're the only ones that are going through this stuff. And because we're not willing to talk about it very much, um, we sort of develop like this island that we all think that we have to live on without, you know, the help, this quiet desperation that we all live as men. And, and so that was like, that was probably, you know, that year, you know, really the first six months of it where I was like, wow, this is, this is my new tribe. You know, these type of people that are constantly driven to do more, to find more, and it's happening more. I'm noticing it now more like with my old colleagues, you know, cause I work with a lot of them now, um, you know, helping them where, you know, this has become more popular, but this was, this was a very, um, this, this was not a sexy thing to talk about, you know, in the culture that I worked in, you know, you improving yourself, you doing something different, you be, you getting uncomfortable, you trying new things. Like, again, I, I go back to that locker room statement or there were, you know, in, on a trading floor there, are, you know, your, your, your arm, arm length to arm length, basically, maybe less. So my arm length, less than my yeah. arm lengths away from each, each guy, 30 guys, people can hear your conversation at all times. You say anything remotely stupid. You got guys coming off the top rope, like, you know, look, looking to drop an elbow on you um, for, for saying something silly. And so you, you know, I learned very early that the best way you know, the, or the quickest way for me to succeed was to just put my head down, work, don't say anything stupid, don't challenge the narrative around me, um, and certainly don't do things that other people aren't doing. Now, I got comfortable doing that my last few years of my career, uh, but it took me you know, 18 years, 17 years to do that. So the long-winded answer to your question or to shorten it up is, you know, between Sean, Steven and, Sean Stevenson and Jay Frugia, who now has become a very good friend of mine, 
Um, those are probably the two guys that I, I would I'd pinpoint, but there was no like moment or, you know, event or saying or anything like that, that I sort of, you know, learned to live by what I, what I realized that I did to change my life was just take action. One small action yep. after one small action, after one small action repeatedly, and it hasn't stopped and it won't stop until the day I die. Is there a guy right now you mentioned as you sat at the desk, the guy who was across from you that was making seven figures, 50 pounds overweight. That was, you were like, all right, this is the guy that I'm going to emulate because that's, he's at the top of this profession, the, the pinnacle of this profession where I am right now. Is there where you are right now, the space you currently occupy? Who's that guy who's a step ahead of you or two steps ahead of you? Like, you know what? I want to try to live in the way that this man is living. That's a great question. There's, there's a few guys I would say, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm interested in doing something a little bit different. You know, I think ultimately I want to take my two expertises, which is now, you know, health and wellness transformation being, you know, uh, the man that I think a lot of us really truly want to be the father that a lot of us truly want to be the husband. Uh, and also my experience sitting in a corporate culture environment and, and bringing those into, into a corporate wellness product, um, which is something that I will be doing soon. Uh, so I'm not sure of anybody in that space that's really doing this, which is why I think it's a great business opportunity yeah. for me. But in the individual, you know, kind of man space, Ryan Mickler, uh, Bedros Koulian, um, Garrett White, a couple of those guys are really, really great as far as like their messaging, um, their commitment. I'm, I'm, what, I'm, what I've become really interested in is, you know, do your actions align with your words? And that's something that I realized that for years and years and years, I broke promises to myself on a daily basis. I would say all the same shit that everybody else would say, you know, on Monday morning, right? This is a Monday. We'd wake up foggy from Sunday with all these bullshit commitments that we were going to make. I'm not going to drink this week. You know, I'm going to stop gambling. I'm not going to gamble until Saturday. You know, like all these things that we tell ourselves, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the gym three days this week. You know, all these things that by Wednesday are a distant, distant memory. And I just got tired of breaking that commitment that I would make to myself every Monday. Or that the you know the the, the the pep talk I would have myself, and I just this like your life changes um, exponentially when you start to take personal responsibility, and when you start to own the things that you've done in the past, and the things that more importantly to me, the things that you're doing today, because that's the only way to really impact the future, right? Like we all have regret, we all have our dark demons from our past. A lot of them we can't do much about, you know. But what can you do? You can do something about it right now. It's very cliche. You can't control the future, right? The only way to really impact the future uh, is to do something about it today. So it's really, it's super cliche, but uh, it's really, you know, one thing that I try to, you know, live my life by now. Like what, you know, am I all in on this conversation right now, you know, or am I thinking about the next thing I have to do after this, you know, or am, am I, am I, am I where my feet are? Jesse Itzler, I don't know if you guys know who that is. He's the, uh, he's married to Sarah, Sarah Bra Blakely, who's the, the CEO of Spanx, the founder of Spanx. He's a super successful guy in his own right. And that's a great saying that he has, be where your feet are. You know, how often are we other places when our kids are talking to us, we're in our phones, we're thinking about the next email. Uh, when our wives are talking to us, you want to get laid more? That, you know, uh, st start paying attention when your wife talks. You know, so uh, little things like that are things that I focus on. There were five different ways I want to go from that, com that conversation. I'm first going to start with, I was thinking it before you said it, about being where your feet are. I didn't, I don't know that, um, that saying or that book, but what I wanted to, to mention was I feel like you're sitting across from me talking to me right now. Like what you're saying, it really feels like I'm having an intimate conversation with you across the table. That's how it really, it resonates to me um, mm -hmm. or what's with me. The other thing I, the, the way that you communicate with your significant other, you, you recently had a post or you put it up in your story about, um, you know, when you're, when you're significant other, your wife, your girlfriend, whoever asks you, you know, where do you want to go for dinner? And your response is, I don't care. I don't care. I'll, I'll do whatever. And I lived in that yeah. space for a long period of time where you, you think you're saying it to just, you know, be like non-confrontational, nice yeah, like like, being like, nice, oh, but that's bullshit. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. looking to you to give them opinion, to validate their, their, um, their question. And, and basically what you're saying is, I don't, f I don't, I don't care. I don't give a shit with what you're saying. I'm going to like, go go the path of least resistance here so talk to us a little bit about that you mentioned you know you're you help people that reignite their relationship to spark in their marriage with their yeah. significant other um what are things that like commonalities that you see with men that are really struggling in that area yeah so the, the main thing is what i struggled with too is we we triple down on what's working in our life 
right? And what's working in our life after a 14 and, you know, a half year marriage oftentimes is not our marriage, you know, it's our career. And so a lot of us in our 30s and 40s is when we are, you know, building wealth, we're building equity in our careers. And, you know, it's hard at home. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to juggle, you know, like who in their right mind, you know, would sign up for this insanity of trying to build wealth, trying to be an amazing husband, trying to raise a family and do all the other things that, you know, that come along with this. And so anyone who is trying to do this is constantly failing at it because it's near impossible to be perfect at all of it. And so the point is to not necessarily be perfect. The point is, is to understand and have some recognition when you're off the rails in one of the pillars of your life, right? So is, has your health come at the expense you know, of your success at work? Has your marriage, the quality of a relationship come at the expense of, you know, uh, you know, your, your, your obsession with fitness or, you know, or again, your, your work. And so a lot of times what happens and what happened with me was, you know, my body was breaking down. My marriage wasn't that great, but work was good. So I just put more focus into work because if I just work harder at work, the rest of the stuff will probably, you know, figure itself out over time. And so, you know, I like to talk to people about, or we, you know, we make sure that we audit what's happening. You know, again, another financial concept, right? Companies do audits constantly. You know, you're a member of a sales team. You have a weekly meeting. You know, I was, I was a part of a morning research meeting every day for 20 years. Companies report their earnings quarterly. If they're a public company companies that I used to trade that were either in bankruptcy or they were in bankruptcy, you know, when you have a, you have to report monthly to your creditors. And so individuals don't do these things. We have no mechanism to slow down and take stock of what's happening in our life and no structure around that. And when we do that, oftentimes it shines a light on some pretty shitty areas that we want to avoid. And so when we get that feedback, the key is to go figure out what you can do, what small thing can you do? And so the example that I gave as far as like double or tripling down on a career, you know, I work with guys and I experience this too where you might have two or three months in a row that you know are going to be really crazy with work. You know, I work with a CEO who's selling his business in a couple of months. He is out four nights a week. He has uh, lunches coming into the office, presentations, investors coming into the office. He's working on the weekends. He's, there's no chance he's going to be a class A husband and father, right? For those two or three months. So, he can't just go, oh, I need work-life balance, right? That doesn't work. Work-life balance is a farce, you know, in terms of everything being equally balanced at all moments in time. That most likely means that you're not working hard enough in at least one of those categories. But what he could do, what I could have done during those moments is after that audit realize, oh, shit, you know, this is going to take, you know, a lot of work at home once I'm done. I'm really going to have to figure out ways to prioritize the relationships that I need to. Have that conversation with your wife. Tell her, listen, the next, the next three months are going to be really tough. You know, maybe book a, a weekend getaway uh, for three months and a week after, you know, and have a conversation, an open conversation. Look, like, if you feel neglected during these times, please talk to me. I'm going to do my best to do these certain things. I'm going to try to prioritize the family. But the reality is I'm going to be a little bit more disconnected than I normally am with you. And what we do is we just assume that they're supposed to know what's going through our mind and what we're struggling with and know that there's this a lot of pressure, but our wives just think that, you know, we're working too hard and not paying attention to them. And so, you know, I think really understanding where you're at in your life and what's going on in these different pillars uh, is a huge part of making sure you're constantly communicating. And for guys who, you know, don't like the word communicate or connect with their wife, think sex. Okay. If both of those things are, you know, at all time high levels, so will your sex life. And so get over the fact that, you know, you need to connect more. You need to connect the deeper levels. You need to communicate more because that's how women get warmed up. Guys are physical touch guys. Guys are, are we can have a, you know, my wife and I just uh, did, recorded a podcast yesterday where jokingly it's like, you know, my wife's like, well, you could be talking about our taxes and then be ready. I'm like, or did we just talk about our taxes? Because I'm ready. <laughs> I, I got a chub right now. Yeah, I, got, yeah. I don't know the first thing you just said, but I'm ready. Yeah. 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 What did you say? I, I only yeah. caught the second part. Yeah, yeah. No, so like, Your pants you got to understand, there's a great book called The Five Love Languages. Yeah. Um, if you guys are not familiar yeah, with that, yeah. you should check it out. Right? And so the, the point is, is that we feel 
um, we, we receive and give love in different ways. And most guys are all physical touch guys. There's five different physical touch, quality time, acts of service, um, uh, gifts, and words of affirmation. You know, baby, you're the best, right? And so I've had guys whose wives are acts of service people, and they've gotten laid twice as much by just doing the damn dishes or taking out the, the, the garbage or taking their daughter to the dance cl uh, class that their wife usually does, taking something off their plate. My wife is a quality time person. If I go in and just try to like get physical, like she'll allow me because she knows that I'm a physical touch guy, but that doesn't warm her up. I won't, like me asking her to go for a walk for 10 minutes or go outside and pour a glass of wine and have a conversation. Like my chances of getting laid go up exponentially when I do things like that. And so understanding how your wife wants to be loved, understanding how she communicates. If we don't do that, we're just talking different languages. We're talking, Fran you know, you're talking English, she's talking Spanish. I'll take it back to almost the, you know, you mentioned sports a couple different times. It, the way that I would look at it would be your coach on the sidelines. If two of the, you know, two of the five that are going out in the starting five know what offense you're running, it's still not going to work because the other three don't know what the fuck they're doing. So as men, if we, we might have it in our minds exactly what's happening, but if we're not able to clearly communicate the playbook and what we think it is to our significant other, they're like, what the fuck play are you running? Who's supposed to be screening here? I'm supposed to do a pick and roll, whatever it is. You're not on the yeah. same page there. Yeah. There's a phrase I love uh, that I heard recently. Of like if, if, uh, if, if guys treated the end of their relationship or if we treated the end of a, of, of a, of a relationship like the beginning, there'd be no end. You know, like you just remember how, and I, this is hard shit. Like I've been married. I've known my wife for 17 years. Like to pretend that we have the same spark, you know, that we did 17 years ago when we first met, like in our, you know, in my late twenties, like, of course not. But, you know, is there, is it, is it just different, but equal in certain, certain ways? Absolutely. But like, do you go back to how, how interested were you, you know, at that dinner? How interested were you on the phone when you were talking? You know, obviously you weren't talking about kids because you didn't have any, but, but were you just, are you, are you just talking about the kid's schedule and, and the chicken that you're eating at dinner? You know, like start to ask, you know, deeper questions that, that in involve like, you know, some thought, some excitement, you know, like if we were, there's a, a question that I stole from somebody that I love, like, you know, if 10 years from now, when we're out on our patio, you know, toast, like having a drink, like, what are we, to what are we celebrating? You know, and it really puts a lot of thought in like my son's 12, 12 right now. Shit. He's 22. He's in college, right? Or maybe just graduated college. My daughter is 17. She, maybe she's just going to college. Like that brings about a lot of emotions. Like, and you really start to understand what's important to her, you know? And so it might come out that like, she's super worried about like your, your ability to send the kids to college, you know, because of that. like, I, I don't know what's going to come out of it, but, but what I know for me has been like just this really thoughtful, deeper level of connection and conversation where it turns, you, you guys turn into dating again, you know? And like, do you, ha you have to date your wife. Like if you are not dating your wife, you know, you're living as roommates, you know, you're, you're, you're living as co-parenters co tours. And like, yeah, maybe you're gonna get laid every once in a while, but I can tell you from experience, you know, and I still have a lot of work to do in this category, but um, quantity, quality, exponentially rise you know when you do these types of things 100 percent agree with that and i mean now from this conversation i know that if i you know lean in and i say tax taxes in a really <laughs> sexy way to you then... my chances of of you sitting in my lap is going to improve <laughs> exponentially as well you need you need a nicer set of, <laughs> set, of set of you know what i'm going to sit in the lap but... And listen, we, there aren't many men that we have on this podcast that we can say, "Hey, what's up, big guy?" To I think it was just Greg Lewis right now. Who was the only one who was because yeah. we're both six right. four. Yeah. So you like we can say, "What's up, big guy?" <laughs> like we can absolutely say <laughs> and that. And that sounds you. great <laughs> after you just told him to sit on your face. So it really. I never said yeah. face. I never oh, said yeah, face. I'm not into that. I'm just. Yeah. I'm in California, boys. None of this so, is none of this <laughs> is uncomfortable to me. All right. <laughs> so. Brian Penuza, where can the Building Men podcast listeners find you? How can we get in touch with you? Because I definitely want um, the audience to follow along with what you're doing and then find out where you live and send scented candles your way. There you go. With there that. you go. Yeah, my address is now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I have a podcast, which I'm super excited to have you guys on. We're going to run it back, as we say, in hoops yeah. um, and, uh, and, and do an interview with you, and that'll be out soon. So 
Uh, that is called the success lift. That's the name of my program. It's a little bit of a play on some bond trading. We don't need to go into that, but you can find everything you need to uh, either at my podcast, which is the success lift podcast or the success lift.com. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm active on, on the socials as my name, Brian Panuzo. Uh, and you guys are, you guys have been great, man. I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to have me on. Uh, it's super exciting to get to talk to, to other men who are, you know, out here trying to, you know, build uh, better men, you know, whether it be through it, through your mission of, uh, of building, you know, maybe younger men and, and, and spreading this message that you do. Um, I, I've gotten super passionate about that with my kids uh, and my son's sports teams. I just had my son's baseball team over this weekend to, uh, to talk to them. We started a little book club. So um, we need more people doing this stuff because ultimately, you know, there's this mushroom effect. I feel like that, you know, when you change one man's life, right? You don't just change his, it's his wife, it's his family, and it's all his friends. And you can really watch this stuff spread. And it's pretty cool, man. It's pretty cool. The other thing is you might change someone's life, say something to someone now and not even recognize the impact it's going to have down the road. Like it, something might not resonate with them today, but all of a sudden in six months from now, they think of something, talk to someone else, and that can spur this you know, ripple effect that could you know, really change, change the trajectory of the world in that direction. Um, 100%. Anthony, any final thoughts? No, thank you, dude. Appreciate it. That was awesome. And it's definitely, I think we can both say confidently that, that you would be a role model for us, you know, a success story, someone to look up to because you're doing what we want to do. You know, we both sort of like gave up our career paths to do this and we're putting all the chips in. So it's nice to see somebody that's doing it and doing it well. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'm excited for you guys. I can't wait to follow along. Anthony, Venice is ready for you, man. So just come on out whenever you're, whenever you're ready, <laughs> Absolutely. buddy. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll hang. And you just Definitely. said a, a LL Cool J. You're doing it and doing it well. Did that's I? right. You did. You absolutely did. Let's go. It's a 90s rap. We got to go back there. I mean, that like, <laughs> forget about putting the candle on. You put that song on. Uh, that's i mean that's, that's wait, a way, way to bring it all that's back a, full that's circle. Right. now i'm back, I'm uh, back. I, I almost i almost left the the, the zoom recording yep. in the beginning and that's now, what right I now i want to stay longer, <laughs> yeah. I stay longer. <laughs> that's great that's what we do here so we'll have you on again and we'll we'll shoot the shit when we get to that spring flavor the spring candles spring whatever candles. those might be like yeah, little perfect daffodil or lavender yeah so <laughs> i'll end with that building men podcast uh check us out on instagram building.men um, buildingmencoach at gmail.com go a step further than you thought you'd go and we'll see you next time on Building Men